Okay, thanks, Julian. Can you hear me? Good. All right. So the most important thing uh, I can tell you at the start of the talk is think of lots of questions. If you're curious about anything, think of a question. At various points, I'll be stopping. And uh, the talk will go much better if you come up uh, with lots of them. OK, so I used to um, work at CERN. I did a two-year job there, research job, um, a postdoctoral research associate, it's called, before I came back here to uh, Cambridge. And uh, as you're, I'm sure you're all aware, you've seen on the news, there was a big discovery at CERN um, that was announced um, a year or two ago. Um, and that's the discovery of the Higgs boson. That really is huge news. That's going to be in the history books um, for millennia to come. And it was very exciting. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, talk to you a little bit about that. I can't resist telling you about the Higgs boson. I'm also going to tell you about uh, dark matter and why the Large Hadron Collider at CERN might be able to tell us something about the dark matter. OK, so. I'm very lucky. I'm a theoretical physicist, what they call a phenomenologist. So that means I care about data. I care about what's going on in the experiment. But I don't sit there with a screwdriver trying to make it work, because it would all be in bits, and I wouldn't be able to get it back together again. And so um, I uh, test models of the early universe and of how particles interact. And I suggest how the experiments might um, look for new particles, um, how they should sieve their data in order to find them, uh, and the interesting properties which they should measure. So I spend a lot of my time thinking about fundamental particles, smaller than an atom, um, and they're tiny, right? And, um, but I spend some of my time thinking about the universe, which is about as big uh, as you can get. And so um, you know that sometimes happens within a day. I have to shrink my mind and then you know, grow it. And um, it's a bit, it reminds me of uh, Alice in Wonderland, where you, know, you drink a potion, you go very small, and uh, you eat a mushroom, and you grow very big. So <laughs> I want you to come on a journey with me to the very small and the very large. OK, so um, this is just going to set the frame for the, the main, main topic, which is um, dark matter. So this, and what I'm going to show you, is a simulation of a galaxy just like ours. So each one of these white dots represents uh, a star, just like our sun. And they're all rotating around. It's a spiral gallery, um, galaxy. And uh, OK, we're getting to about a billion years now, so obviously it's sped up a bit. And they rotate around the center of mass, um, mainly just due to Newtonian gravity um, and inertia and um, you know, the usual thing. And uh, OK, so when we look out at other galaxies than ours, uh, we can measure the speeds uh, at which these stars are going around the center pretty well by coming from the properties of the light that, that are given off by the stars. And um, we can use standard gravitational theory to predict how fast they should be going. Okay? Uh, it should be a you know, very basic uh, science question. OK, you need to know how much matter is there. So, but you know roughly the mass of a star. So within to say 20% or so, you can guess the distribution of matter through here. And when you look at that picture and you compare the predictions using gravitational theory to what's measured, what you find is something doesn't add up, something very fundamental. The stars around the outside are going way too fast compared to the theory. And so something has got to give. And uh, you know, maybe our theory of gravity is wrong. Or, um, or something else. And the problem is, um, many people have tried to tinker with gravity, tinker with Einstein's equations and even Newtonian gravity, to try and make um, this picture add up with observations. But the problem is it's very difficult to do that while keeping all the things that we know about our theory, where the theory of gravity works, for example, in the solar system, and actually, even in the universe as a whole, it's very difficult to m keep that working while well, make the galaxy spin faster around the outside. So what we think is probably going on instead is that there's some extra matter there um, that you can't see. It's invisible. So it's, oh, and it's transparent to light. Um, and against the nighttime sky, it looks dark. And that's why it's called dark matter. And indeed, 
um, very probably um, we have dark matter in our galaxy and even more probability, uh, well, with the same probability, um, there's a wind of dark matter going through us right at the moment. So this stuff is fleeting. It hardly interacts with matter at all, except by gravity. It would go, most of it would go straight through the Earth. You, um, according to the if you, estimates, you should have about 20,000 times the, ma the mass of a hydrogen atom worth of dark, dark matter in you at any moment. Um, and there's a, the wind of it going through you is going at about um, 400 kilometers an hour, astonishingly. So um, obviously, if this stuff is really around, uh, it's not like a, a standard wind or standard stuff. So what I'm going to do is um, frame these questions. What is dark matter? And how does it behave? And how, does, how can CERN help us uh, answer those two questions? So we're going to go on a journey to uh, find, those, find that out. And how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to go down the rabbit hole by shrinking ourselves. So what I want to do is just get, you, get our minds into the kind of distance scales that we're talking about. So if we shrink ourselves down to the size um, of uh, a fly, we might get worried because it's looking hungry and it's carnivorous. So um, that's about a centimeter, say. If we shrink ourselves down to a millimeter, now we're at the size of about the fly's eye. Um, and we've got all these compound segments in it. It's kind of amazing. So then we shrink ourselves down another hundredth of a millimeter. You'd be able to see the bristles in between the segments of the fly's eye. Further down again to a millionth of a millimeter. If we could shrink ourselves that much, we'd be able to see the strands of DNA in the fly's eye. So around the outside of the um, helical structure, we have these spheres which are artist representations of um, atoms, of course. And so if we zoom in on one of those, uh, at 10 millionth of a millimeter, this is a representation of an atom. It's completely wrong, not just because of the face, right? Um, the central bit should be much smaller, etc. cetera. But uh, I've drawn a face on one because um, that uh, particle is a proton, and that's going to help us answer our questions that we posed um, at the start. So very good. So uh, in order to do that, what I, what I need to do is take, us, take our minds back to one second after the beginning of time. OK, so one second after the Big Bang. One second after the Big Bang. Big Bang was very quiet, by the way. Um, so one second after the Big Bang, the universe, everything in the universe observable, anything we can see today, the observable universe, would fit in the atmosphere above the UK, okay? The atmosphere of the Earth. So, of course, if you try and squeeze all of that, all of those stars and everything into that small space, they don't exist as stars and planets anymore. They are, um, it's an extremely hot, dense plasma of gas. There's lots of particles whacking around um, at very high temperatures. And if we Think about the particles in this uh, primordial soup, as it's called. Um, then we get. Um, <laughs> then uh, then uh, we we have energy just knocking around. The particles are all just bouncing against each other, um, and that's what being hot is really: is particles jiggling around and bouncing off of each other. So at this point, I'll take any questions that anyone has. Yeah. So the, the question is, where does, did the plasma come from? I think the answer to that is no one knows yet, for sure. The universe was born with um, space that's expanding very quickly, um, and time, which is also expanding very quickly, um, and lots of energy in it. And we don't really know where that energy came from. If you've read Stephen Hawking's book, The Brief History, History of Time, you'll know that in the 80s, he solved uh, some of the equations with the evolution of the universe, and it required um, an injection of energy. Um, and he said, well, whatever that is, that is a divine being, right? So he was being consulted by the Vatican on, uh, because he thought he had a, an argument for the existence of a divine uh, creator. Um, but since then, um, he found uh, a solution which could uh, happen randomly. Um, and didn't require a divine creator. I don't think he's um, advising the Vatican anymore. 
But the answer is no one knows. That's an open question. Yeah. Yeah. The question is, are galaxies orbiting anything? Um, and the answer is yes, they are. They, you have clusters of galaxies, which kind of, and the galaxies move within those clusters. And you have super clusters, which are clusters of clusters of galaxies, which again move. So on all distance scales, stuff's going on and, and things are moving. Yeah. OK, let's carry on for a bit. So um, we go back to our primordial soup. And um, at the moment, one second after the Big Bang, everything's too hot, and uh, protons can't even exist yet. You've got three particles that make them up. They're uh, quarks. They're just uh, rattling around um, themselves. But as the universe, um, the Big Bang happens and the universe uh, gets large, the space in between the particles gets, gets larger, and the gas cools down. And at some stage, the, these quarks are no longer bouncing around too much and they can sort of stick together, which they like to do when it's cool, cool enough, to form um, our particle, the proton, which has just been born. So we're going to follow this proton um, throughout its life cycle in order to um, try and answer our questions about dark matter. OK, so um, lots of boring stuff happens. Matter gets together, um, it forms um, gas clouds, these form stellar nurseries, um, the matter clumps through gravity, it heats up, it produces uh, different elements, and then finally you get, or later on you get the formation of uh, galaxies, stars, and uh, planets, um, and civilization, as we see here. Um, but, and, and the invention of Belgium and jam. But um, something really interesting happens in uh, 1954, um, after the terrible conflict um, that ended in 1945, um, the Second World War, scientists and uh, politicians around Europe got together and they said, we never want that to happen again, Certain, you know, and we want to do everything we can to stop it. And what we need, given that both world wars started um, in Europe, what we need is, a, is something, a center of stability, a beacon that will help provide political and um, military stability throughout Europe. And so they invented um, a common goal for all Europeans and European scientists. And that goal was CERN, where um, scientists from different countries could go and all work together on a common scientific project. Um, the governments would have to each pay into uh, CERN in order to keep it going. But it would be you know, a common project that everyone uh, worked on collaboratively. So let me introduce CERN now. So um, this is our galaxy. If we go into one of the outer arms, sort of two-thirds of the way along, um, we might find our sun and then our Earth, which is here. And what you can see, zooming, we're zooming in on now, that moustache-shaped la la lake is Lac Le Mans. And uh, we have Geneva just uh, a few miles away from it just on the border with France. And uh, if you fly in to Geneva, you won't see this white line, um, which is in a circle on the, on the surface, because, of course, that's, just, that's where the beam line of uh, CERN is. So it's 100 meters underneath the ground, um, but, we've, but we've just drawn it on the surface here. OK, so um, it's big. It's about the size of the circle line. Um, it's 18 miles. Um, circle. So this is the biggest man-made uh, experiment, or biggest machine, really, man-made machine um, that exists. It's very impressive. If you ever go to Geneva, uh, a few weeks before you go, get online and um, go to the CERN website and book yourself a free guided tour around CERN. There's about 20 a day. Um, real CERN scientists who are volunteers will uh, take you around. They'll if you can, you'll go down to um, the experiments. That depends on whether it's running or not. So at the moment, um, it's running, and you won't be able to uh, go down. But there's plenty of other stuff uh, to see. And there's some stuff on the surface, um, some experiments on the surface that you can see. So I really recommend that. It's, it's well worth a, a look. 
Okay, so um, there's a th so this 18 kilometers, uh, 18 miles around tunnel um, looks like this. There's one of the maintenance crew on a motorized tricycle uh, going around. And this thing in um, the blue there, that's Oxford blue, um, that contains two beams of protons going in opposite uh, directions. And uh, that's basically what the Large Hadron Collider is, is this system of blue pipes that goes all the way around um, this circle. Okay, so you can see that it's about um, th the size of the circle line because uh, the curvature of the tunnel is roughly the same at Bank Station as it is to um, CERN. Okay, so, um, so remember it's 100 meters below ground. Uh, why is it 100 meters below ground? Well, that's because uh, we want to shield everything from ordinary radiation that you get on the surface, which comes from space, right? There's cosmic rays coming down. If you put it 100 meters below the rock, nearly all of that cosmic radiation is filtered out um, uh, in the rock. And so when you measure things, you can do it uh, very cleanly without having, to, having that polluting your data, basically. So you see there are experimental halls where there are caverns um, carved out of the rock in various places. That's where um, the, the actual experiments uh, take place. So um, if, if we look down on a, a kind of map of CERN, it looks a lot more complicated than just this one circle that I was talking about. The um, circle is the big one at the top. So that's the thing that's 18 miles around. But you can see that um, actually it requires uh, a complex of different accelerators. And in fact, what we're going to do is start right here, um, which is where everything begins at CERN in the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and at the moment, I'll take, I'll take questions again, if there are any. Yeah. Yeah, good question. So w the question is, what experiments do you do? So um, what we do is we take these beams of protons and you cross the streams. I'll show you, actually. It's on the, on the graph. So uh, in a way that I'll explain in a minute, you get them spinning these proton beams to high energies. They're going around in opposite directions in the big circle. And where there's like a yellow star, that's where the streams are crossed and the protons are slammed into each other. And what I, what I call an experiment is um, a machine that you build around the outside of that crossover point to measure what comes out, basically. So that's, that's the basic thing. But we'll go more into that in the talk. Yeah. So the question is, um, they, these beams are getting close to the speed of light. Is that important? Um, because of time dilation and so on. And uh, yeah, it is. Uh, the main thing that you're after, though, is um, the energy. Because what, what we need is high energy. And I'll explain why later. Um, but it's true. Um, OK, protons last for a very long time. So it's not like they, with some other particles, for example, muons, they de decay away unless you sped them up really quick and slowed time down for them. But uh, protons aren't like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one at the back, maybe. Yeah, OK. So um, the question was, lots of people thought that um, the Large Hadron Collider might create a black hole. Why was that? So what happened was um, two uh, guys in Hawaii, I think at least one of them, I think they were biologists, they sued the US government for supporting CERN because they said, um, oh, we've heard about this possibility that it might produce a black hole and destroy the Earth. OK, so then the press got hold of it. CERN PR division uh, made an explicit decision to, um, to really engage with this uh, story, because they, they thought, well, OK, what we're going to do is be really open about everything. We'll set up a little panel to um, discuss this possibility, and uh, we'll set, we'll will tell lot people lots of science uh, that will get into the media because of this black hole story, basically. Now, so there was some research that this was based on. 
And the idea was if there are large, not large, if there are relatively large extra space dimensions, then there was a theoretical possibility that you could produce uh, like a mini black hole, like a really tiny atomic sized one. Um, and people were writing scientific papers about this. But the thing is, it wouldn't behave like a one that you've seen in interstellar or whatever. That's an astrophysical black hole. These small ones would just um, pop immediately. But it'd be really exciting because it'd be a signature that there are, there's a, um, an extra a fourth space dimension right? that's, that's kind of curled up, up on itself. Now, what, what CERN did was, say, was said, well, we don't know whether we're going to be able to produce these mini black holes or not. We think they would be safe even if we did. But um, actually, let's not, let's not just rely on theory. Um, let's use um, observations and evidence to make sure that it's going to be safe. And basically, all you need to know is that the moon has been around for the last five billion years, and nothing bad's happened to it. Because there are cosmic rays with protons in it slamming into the moon with huge energies, um, the same energies as they have at the LHC, and actually some with more uh, as well. And nothing bad has uh, happened. So even if a few black holes are being produced on the moon because of the cosmic rays hitting it, it's not, eat, it's not swallowing the moon up. So, so, I mean, there was no doubt that it was going to be safe. Um, yeah. Good question. Yeah. If that's the start of protons out here, how do you actually get them and start them off? Very good question. And uh, I'm going to show you that now. So that's where we start the protons. So our proton's amazing, right? It was born second, out, well, it was born actually at the Big Bang, as far as we know. It really formed uh, one second afterwards. It's seen the creation of um, uh, Belgium and Jam and uh, the sun. And somehow it's ended up in this bottle of hydrogen here um, at 100 meters underground uh, in CERN. So what happens is um, this valve is uh, automatically opened at the top and uh, a few billion of these hydrogen atoms are, um, are sucked out of the bottle and then the valve shut again. That gas is then heated up. Um, it's ionized with electric fields. So the electrons go one way and the protons go another way. So you extract the protons off. And then what you do is you spin them up. Well, actually, you start off in a linear accelerator. So you've got the protons in a little tube. And with electric and magnetic fields, you kind of um, speed them up. And you feed them into a ring, which is called the proton synchrotron here. And they're sped up there in the proton synchrotron again, um, kicked by electric fields and focused by magnetic fields to 87% of the speed of light. Um, and then they're gradually skimmed off and fed into a bigger ring, this SPS ring, um, where they're sped up further. And then they're skimmed off and fed into the big ring in each counter-rotating beams in each direction. And as you probably noticed, they're going at 99.9999% of the speed of light by then. Um, so that's, that's basically how it works. Um, OK. So um, yeah, so if we um, think about these protons, actually what happens is um, you have uh, a few meters long uh, uh, le length of the beam pipe has these protons in. This is an artist's representation of them speeding down um, the, the uh, beam pipe, which is uh, you know vacuum in, in a vacuum, um, and uh, yeah, they're um, kicked along Oops. until um, they get to one of these crossing points. Now, this few meters long of protons, um, then there's then there's a gap in the beam pipe. And then there's another few meters long, long of uh, you know, protons. And each of those lengths is called a, a bunch, right? So you have thousands of these bunches of protons going around the ring in each direction. And um, this isn't to scale. Actually, the protons are really, really tiny. Um, they're focused in a beam which is sort of a millimeter across. But still, there's, uh, they're nearly all space, right? There's only tiny little dots. So when you cross the streams, nearly always, these protons just zoom past each other. Um, but um, so if you look at any proton, it's very unlikely to hit another one uh, when you cross the streams. But usually when, you, you know, when um, a billion protons goes past a billion other protons, 
a couple of them will um, bump into each other and interact. And so that's what um, you're there to measure. They collide into each other and they go into a thousand fiery fragments, which you measure um, by building one of these detectors uh, around it. And you want to measure various properties of these fiery fragments and do kind of detective work to go back to the moment that they um, hit each other, try and work out exactly what's going on there. So this is an uh, answer to your question about, um, you know, is it speed or is it energy that, that counts? This shows you the different accelerators like the Large Hadron Collider that have happened since um, 1960. And on the vertical axis, so year of first switch on is on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis is the energy of the beams. Um, and each, what you need to know is each time you go up um, to one of these horizontal lines, the energy get, goes up by a factor of 10. So here you have 1 billion electron volts worth of energy. Here it's 10 billion, then 100 billion, then 1,000. And the Large Hadron Collider is way up um, here on the right-hand side. And, um, you know, back here we were only doing 1 billion um, electron volt collisions, whereas now we're doing 1,000. So there's this push to go higher and higher in the energy. And why is that? Well, the reason is um, basically because you want to discover new fundamental particles. We want to find all the ones that exist uh, and forces too between them. And um, what you do is you use Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared, right? So E is the energy, which is of the beams. And what you try and do is, to, is turn that into m, into mass. So you try and produce successively heavier and heavier fundamental particles by turning the energy of the beams into mass. And the idea is, uh, during all of last century, there were many new particles discovered because down here, perhaps you didn't have the energy to produce a particle that's um, got a mass 10 times this amount. But by the time you get up here, you can produce it. And that's one of the reasons why the Higgs boson wasn't discovered before in all of these experiments. It's just too heavy. It's 125 times the mass of the proton, that's too heavy for all of these previous experiments to find. OK, so these detectors that we build around, um, that have been built around the crossing points, act as 3D digital cameras, basically. They're really complicated beasts. Uh, there's lots of sub-detectors, um, and they're in a vaguely concentric kind of cylindrical pattern. Um, this is one of them that's incompleted, um, which is the Atlas uh, detector. As you can see, these are people here, so um, these things are huge. The cavern's 40 meters tall. So if you go down there, it does look like a Bond villain's lair. Um, it's really fun uh, to go down. What you can see, these big structures here are um, the barrel toroid um, magnets. So they're kind of a solenoidal magnet system that produce a great big magnetic field, very strong magnetic field throughout the whole uh, structure. And the way that these fiery fragments curve in the magnetic field tell you the charge of the particles. The amount of curvature tells you what the energy of the particles is. And so by using these uh, machines, you can find out all of the things that you want to know about these fiery fragments that are coming off of the collisions. So are there any questions? Yes, good question. So the question is, um, what's, to paraphrase, what's the main goal of CERN and what will you do afterwards? So remember, this was all started in 1954. So actually, the main goal really is pure science. It's to try and find out what's going on, what are the smallest particles, how, um, how the particles interact with each other. And it's not for like uh, to generate money or energy or um, cure cancer or anything like that. The, the primary goal is just to find out how the universe works, okay? But there are lots of, all of those things that I did mention, trying to find a cure for cancer. Well, there's a spin-off at CERN where they're trying to use the beams to um, focus into um, 
into tumours to try and kill them with, in a sort of safer way than, than taking drugs, for instance. Um, there, clearly, you're doing a lot of uh, swap switching between mass and energy um, here. So there is a project to try and deactivate radioactive waste by um, using one of these uh, beams going into the radioactive waste and get energy out at the same time. So although the primary goals aren't um, you know, that practical, um, there's a lot of secondary things that are happening around it that are. Yeah, good question. Any more? Yeah. Well, these are, so, these are the kind of particles that can exist. So, um, you know, there are certain kinds of particles. If you have a proton, they've all got the same mass. All protons have the same mass. Um, there's another kind called an electron. They've all got the same mass as each other as well. But it's different to the protons. So, there's a, in fact, there's only a few different kinds of particles that, that can exist. And these are the building blocks of matter. So it's just you want to find all of those. And so, um, you know, it's just, you've only seen the light ones because you haven't had enough energy. So you try and make the energy uh, more, larger, in order to see, see more different kinds of particle. And, and the large particles, they still be hypothesis so, Say again? The, so all of, what we're after is fundamental particles. Those are ones without any substructure, so, uh, as far as you can tell. Um, okay, so you try and smash them to bits, and uh, y you see that there's there's no kind of unlike the proton, which seems to have three well does have th three point-like particles within it. These seem to be really fundamental ones. Yeah. Okay, so let's um, look at a co one collision, particular collision. It happened on Saturday, 2011. April 23rd at about six minutes past six in the morning. Um, so what we see here are, uh, it seems to be running backwards. I oh, know, wait, yeah. So this is a computer representation of an actual collision that happened. There are billions of these collisions. So the blue protons come in, they hit each other. You get all these tracks in your detector which the computer reconstructs. There are two high energy tracks which are the important ones, which are these um, kind of orange ones here that leave um, deposits in certain bits of the detector, those are particles of light. So what happened is two, part, two protons came in, they produced a bunch of low energy stuff which you're not interested in, and they produced two particles of really energetic light. Now that's, that's um, important because that's how the Higgs boson was discovered. Because one out of every, uh, sorry, four, yeah, two out of a thousand Higgs bosons decays into very energetic particles of light, just like these. So um, that was the signal for a Higgs boson. So what's the, you've, I'm sure you've heard of the Higgs boson, but uh, a lot of people don't really know what the Higgs boson is good for. And um, it is the uh, last piece of a certain uh, jigsaw puzzle. Um, so it's a missing piece. Uh, it's really important. And uh, the piece that it's responsible for is mass. Okay? This is Peter Higgs, who invented the theory. Um, the theory is written on the blackboard behind him. You can see it's really simple. Um, okay, so it's a mathematical theory, of course. Uh, this is a Lagrangian of quantum field theory. Okay, so it involves quantum theory. Um, and uh, all of the techniques that we use in particle physics. But back in 1964, um, Peter Higgs came up with a way that fundamental particles can have mass. Because the standard theory, which worked really well in terms of the data, um, all, apart from it said all particles have to be massless for consistent, mathematical consistency, he worked out that, that uh, actually um, the theory was missing something um, and it was missing what's called the Higgs field. Well, the, well it doesn't matter what it's called. But it, it's the Higgs field. And um, if he put that special kind of field, um, thing, mathematical thing, into the equations, then he could get particles to have mass. And, crucially, it predicted a new particle, the Higgs boson. So the reason the Higgs boson was so important was not because it's an extra new particle. It's really that his mechanism for producing mass was discovered in an experiment. 
So it was like a signal that his theory was correct. Um, the Higgs mechanisms really complicated to explain, um, and we're running out of time, so I'm not going to try and do it now. Um, I can't really do it justice anyway. What I can do is show you how the data came in. So I'm going to speed it up. We're going to start March the 25th in 2011. That's top right. Um, and what you do is you do lots and lots of these collisions, and you'll see why in a second. So what happens is the energy of these, what you do is you, you get all sorts of uh, collisions uh, coming out of these, um, uh, all sorts of things coming out of the collisions. You um, along the horizontal axis, we have the energy of the two particles of light. So, in fact, a lot of the events don't have these two particles of light, so you throw all of those out for, for the time being. You only concentrate on the ones with two particles of light, and if they come in with um, this number of billion electron volts, then you add one into um, this column, and so the data goes up by one. So this is really a histogram of the energies um, of all the different collisions that come in. Now the thing is, a Higgs boson will give you um, two particles of light which are always at the same energy. Okay? But there are other ordinary processes which give you a kind of spread of energies, and that's shown by this blue line, is the prediction from ordinary things um, of um, two for production of two particles of light with various energies. But the Higgs boson should appear as a very sharp peak on top of that, and that's the signal for the Higgs uh, boson appearing, uh, or being in your data. So what you see as time goes on, now we're going through April, you get more and more data. You can see the vertical axis is changing. Um, we're seeing this smooth distribution, which is falling, of ordinary, um, ordinary collisions, which give you two particles of light. There's no particular bumps apart from some statistical wiggles. Um, but keep an eye. So this is data minus the theory here. Data minus the... And what you can see is there starts to be a larger bump in the middle. And what you see is, indeed, there's an excess at 125 giga electron volts. This little bump in the middle above the blue line, that's the signal of the Higgs boson. Now, you have to use um, mathematics and statistics to tell whether that's chance or whether it's really uh, something that's, uh, that's there in the data. And there's, a, there's kind of a gold standard of how improbable that has to be by happening by chance. And um, by the end of 2012, they had enough data to say um, this is definitely not, well, this is in all probability not chance. Um, it, it really is a new particle which appears as this funny little bump on top of a falling distribution. Okay. Two years later, um, or a year or so later, Peter Higgs got uh, his Nobel Prize with this gentleman, Francois Anglais, who also kind of simultaneously made um, a very similar discovery. And it was for their um, theory, the, for the understanding of the origin of mass, but it, the, it was confirmed through the discovery of this particle. So I, we had dinner with um, Peter Higgs. The university gave him an um, honorary degree here, like about a week before they announced the big discovery at CERN. But he'd, he'd, uh, I'd never met him before, but we went out for dinner with some other colleagues. And uh, he knew then that he'd been invited out to CERN. And I said, isn't it really exciting? I, I've hear, heard rumors that uh, you know, they're going to announce the discovery of your boson. And he was like jumping up and down on the stairs. And he, looked, he did look really excited. It's very cute. He's a really nice bloke, really, really modest. If you ask him what his contribution to physics was, he said, well, I was really lucky. I did it in two weeks, and I didn't really do anything else. <laughs> and, and then he, he'll like walk off and ask him to leave him alone. OK, so um, yes. All right, good. Now, uh, so far, we haven't talked about dark matter. And the Higgs boson's probably got nothing to do with it. But I'd better get on, because we're going to run out of time in a minute. Um, now, one of the things I work on uh, a lot is uh, this a theory, a mathematical theory called supersymmetry. And uh, this theory answers a question that's raised by the existence of the Higgs boson. 
because the Higgs boson is way too light. If you, if you use standard theory, all these quantum field theories I've been talking about, to calculate its mass, you find it should be a billion, billion, billion times heavier than they've measured it to be. Okay, so that hugely out. So something's wrong with the theory, for sure. Um, and we, some of us think um, that it might be uh, that we haven't taken supersymmetry into account. So supersymmetry um, is a mathematical symmetry of the theory, which I haven't got time to describe to you. But its signal is it doubles the number of particles uh, that are there. You get, these are the, this is the standard model of particles on the left. All of these particles have been observed. On the top we have the particle of light. Um, here's the Higgs boson. These are matter particles. We've seen all of these, okay. But a consequence of supersymmetry is that each of these particles has um, a copy which is heavier um, and it spins a bit differently. Particles behave like little spinning tops. Um, their spin is quantized, so they can only come in certain units. And these have uh, spins differing by one unit. Okay. So they, they decay um, with different, in different angular um, configurations. So one of these uh, particles on the right-hand side, or in fact a mixture of them, um, has just the right properties to be dark matter. You can just calculate it with theory. It's heavy. It's stable. It's, uh, so it would hang around in the universe. It's uh, got no electric charge, so it doesn't interact with light, so it would be transparent. And you can even go further and say, well, let's take this um, speculative theory um, and uh, predict how much dark matter should be around now. Uh, and indeed, it looks about, looks about right. Um, you follow the equations through the, the early universe and so on. And so um, it's really looking good. The only problem is you haven't seen any of these particles that are predicted. But, of course, with the Large Hadron Collider increasing the energy, the chance now is to try and see them. And the Large Hadron Collider has just started up again, um, with, and it's almost doubled its energy. So I think there's a really good chance in the next year or two years um, that, uh, you know, certainly if this theory is right, we should be seeing those particles. Now, we don't know for sure if the theory is right. It's, it's a speculative idea. Um, it'll be amazing if it is, and I'll get really excited and won't shut up about it. Now, how would it look? Um, well, the thing is, so what happens is you would produce these uh, new heavy particles. Um, not very often. Most of the collisions wouldn't produce them, but one out of a billion or so would. Um, and then it would decay into some stuff you see and some dark matter particles. And the thing is, dark matter acts like a thief. So this is a mock-up of one of these detectors. It's been cut away at the front so you can see what's going on. And so you get the visible stuff coming off as these green arrows. The initial protons are the red arrows going in. So if you consider a direction perpendicular to beam, initially there's no momentum okay, in that direction. But in the final state, in these green arrows, there's momentum coming out uh, towards the floor. I've drawn it. So you know from um, GCSE physics that uh, momentum has to balance. The initial state has no momentum, so the final state must have none. So we infer from this visible stuff coming out towards the floor that something invisible has gone in the opposite direction, uh, given by that black uh, arrow. So uh, what you have to do is statistically uh, test this hypothesis, see if you're getting uh, enough events with uh, things coming out, only coming out in one direction. That uh, would say, well, you produced some dark matter. Uh, and OK, there are many more detailed tests that you can do to look for the other supersymmetric particles. This is one of them. So this is, this is really cutting edge stuff, right? So, this is another energy distribution, this time where you produce some other particles, some electrons or muons, and you plot their energy in this vertical direction. So this is um, actually these black points are the data that were measured in the first run of the LHC. Okay? Standard theory tells you you should get this blue histogram. And so what you're seeing is some extra data, like an extra, another bump now, on top of this. 
It's not as statistical, uh, statistically significant as the Higgs bump. This could have happened with a probability, uh, you know, if you did 100 LHCs in three of them, you'd see some uh, fluctuation like this. So it's not that unlikely. Um, it's fairly unlikely, okay? But um, this is one of the things we've been working on because what we've pr proposed is that um, actually this bump is due to the production of supersymmetric particles. Now, I've drawn you a Feynman diagram um, up here on the right, which I don't expect you to understand. But what you see is um, on the left-hand side, we have two supersymmetric particles being produced, and they de then they decay into other particles. And at the ends, you've got this uh, chi-10. That's the dark matter particle that's uh, coming out. So um, this is really interesting. It's not a discovery because it's not significant enough. But this is precisely the kind of thing you'd be looking for in the second run of data to see if it's still there. Uh, and if it is, it'll be really exciting. And we can tell quite a lot from it. So um, I think what I'm going to do now is just take a few more questions um, before wrapping up, if there are any. Yeah, good, good question. Okay, so um, in fact, when you first impose the symmetry on the theory, everything has the same mass, okay? So everything about these particles, apart from the spin, is, is the same. The same charge. If, it's, if the original particles um, feels the strong force, then the partner does, etc. Now, the problem with that, that theory is it doesn't agree with data because the mass is the same. We would have seen these things. So you've got to break supersymmetry. And uh, so you, you make the model more complicated in order to lift the mass of the extra particles up. Now, it's quite ugly doing that. Um, uh, but you have to, because if it's right, you have to, because of, data, because of data. And the question is, if you break it in that way, does it still solve the problem of the Higgs mass being light? And the answer is, it does. So um, it still solves the problem. Yeah, good question. The question is, could there be another hierarchy even heavier? Um, there could be much heavier things, yes. Um, in fact, we think there will be. There's going to be something at a billion, billion, time, bi billion, billion, billion times the Higgs boson mass, because that's the mass scale associated with gravity. And that mass scale should really come from some fundamental physics. So we're pretty sure there will be um, some states or particles associated with that mass scale, yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay, so um, the, the trouble is, so the, the question is, what about going to higher energies, basically, than the Large Hadron Collider can get to? And indeed, it can only go up to 14,000 billion electron volts. Um, there is a plan for the next collider, instead of 14,000, to go up to 100,000. The problem is, we're, we're hitting really cost problems, um, because to go up to 100,000, now you have to build uh, an 80 mile tunnel under Geneva, which goes under the lake. That's really, that's really expensive. And so unless you completely radically manage to uh, have a breakthrough and change the technology, it's at some point fairly soon, it's going to get too expensive to go up much more. Probably not, not the one after this one, but after that, it's going to get too expensive. So it's really cost that's the problem. Um, yeah. So, um, but, you know, maybe someone will come up with some amazing new technology that will mean you, can, you don't need such a huge accelerator to, to get up to higher energies. Uh, that's always a possibility. Yeah. One last question, yeah. The question is, do you get supersymmetric uh, matter copies of the antiparticles? And the answer is yes, uh, you do. Yeah. Um, every particle has a supersymmetric copy. Yeah. OK, so uh, I'm running out of time. So um, I'm going to wrap up there. Thank you.